We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's. It is reported that at 8.50 p.m., a huge flaming object, believed to be a meteorite, fell on a farm in the neighborhood of Grover's Mill, New Jersey, 22 miles from Trenton. Oh, yeah, I can see the thing's body now. It's large. It's large as a bear. It glistens like wet leather, but that face, that, that, ladies and gentlemen, it's indescribable, but I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. It strikes him head on. Lord, they're turning into flames. Ah! Oh, he's caught up by the woods as far as it's coming this way now. About 20 yards by right. The city of New York lay in ruins. The state of New Jersey had been declared a disaster area. And the entire U.S. Air Force had been downed by a seemingly unbeatable enemy invader. Ladies and gentlemen, incredible as it may seem, those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. At least, if you believed what you heard on the radio. I'm Jim Cameron. On Halloween Eve, 1938, an estimated one million listeners actually thought America was under attack from Martian invaders. People panicked. They ran into the streets. They packed up their families and headed for the hills, all because of a radio play. An adaptation of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, a broadcast so explosive, it changed media forever. panic broadcast happened 60 years ago but we continue to wonder today how could people have believed something so outrageous was it intended as a mean-spirited hoax or simply a chillingly good ghost story for a Halloween Eve in order to find the answers, we need to travel back in time to the fall of 1938, to an era when a magical gadget filled with glowing tubes and a vibrating speaker was fast becoming the focal point of America's households. Back in the 30s, long before television and with talking pictures still in their infancy, radio was mass media, the only game in town. From breaking news to soap operas, dramas and comedies. There is a doctor in the house. A physician who, without anesthetic, sets your body bone, tickles your ribs, and splits your side. It brought the world into your home and workplace and made you a part of it. Suddenly, a third of the population was listening to one show every night. This took a nation of immigrants and made us a people, made us Americans. Bring up the boys, man. Tell them to meet me at Pine Creek Forks. The Flying B payroll's been robbed. Tell the boys to ride. The radio was on 24 hours a day. It was a silver tone, it was the name of the radio, and it had an eye. And you knew you were tuned in when the eye resembled most a human eye. It doesn't make any sense, but the eye seemed to be part of the family. Americans passionately loved and trusted their radios. They turned to them for comfort during the Great Economic Depression and relied on them for up-to-the-minute news as Adolf Hitler's military aggressions in Europe grew more threatening by the day. Listeners also depended upon their magical talking boxes for entertainment for a few precious moments of fantasy and escape from their daily lives. Radio is the theater of the imagination. Radio is the theater of the mind. Hold up there! We'll set fire to the gap and stop. Whoa! Hold on! Hold on! Hold on! Swim! The listener at home created the images. They created what the characters looked like. Where's your paw, Junior? He's back on the far section with the Reaper.
There's another form of popular entertainment that also draws on the power of the imagination to work its sorcery, science fiction. In the 1930s, most sci-fi came in the form of four-color comic strips and lurid pulp magazines. Or B-movies about planet-hopping cowboys with names like Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon. Their idea of special effects was primitive, to say the least. We must destroy that ship. I'll drop down on it. Jack off. Radio of the Earth. There was one man working on the cutting edge of radio who saw past that hokiness and envisioned science fiction's dramatic potential. His name was Orson Welles, the 23-year-old boy genius of the New York stage and a popular voice-for-hire actor on the airwaves. Welles instinctively understood that the persuasive power of radio, plus the outlandishness of science fiction, could yield explosive results. Orson loved science fiction. The thing he always said about science fiction was that it was magic, because you were inventing universes that didn't exist. He knew that everybody had their own demons, so if he just gave you the right background music for the demon, you would create the demon for him. Wells also believed that combining science fiction with radio might help solve his most pressing problem, ratings. His own radio show, The Mercury Theater on the Air, was winning rave reviews, but nobody seemed to be listening. The show couldn't even attract a sponsor. With Halloween just around the corner, Wells and his partner, producer John Houseman, were looking for a way to spark their ratings by giving the audience a good scare. They set their sights on War of the Worlds, a novella by the father of sci-fi, H.G. Wells. Just six days before Halloween Eve, Wells ordered staff writer Howard Koch to update this 1898 tale set in Victorian England into an edgy, modern American thriller. It basically becomes almost a whole new story. I mean, they've got the title, but they can't do it in the modern day without making a lot of changes. And Koch kept trying to beg out of it and saying, I can't do it, and they kept saying, you have to. Black, New York, the Queen Mary. Koch and Wells agreed on the technique of breaking news updates to give the production an immediate and contemporary feel. They couldn't have imagined then how fateful a decision using that technique would be. In the early evening of Sunday, October 30th, as the Mercury players readied themselves for their live broadcast. Across the nation, millions of families were clustering around the consoles in their kitchens and living rooms, settling in for an evening's entertainment. They were blissfully unaware that for the first time in history, science fiction and radio were about to merge with unimaginable results. When Martian mania returns, you had people on the stairs, you know, with the rosaries beads, crying, people crying. The enemy is now in sight above the Palisades. Five, five great machines. I knew it was over. That was the end. Well, I was 11 years old living in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Sunday night was radio night for us, and the kids were allowed to stay up later. In the small town of 2000 in Missouri, where I grew up, right in the center of Missouri, very little of the outside world had seeped in yet then. And uh, so the man across the street had a console radio, and he had invited us over that night to listen to radio. Sunday night, Halloween Eve, 1938. At 8 p.m. Eastern Time, over 30 million Americans turned to their radios for a little relief from news of a depression ending much too slowly and warnings of war in Europe much too quickly on the rise. 
those who tuned into CBS heard this straightforward introduction. The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, that as human beings busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied, perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. To those tuning in to the beginning of the broadcast, it was perfectly clear that Orson Welles was narrating the opening of a suspenseful drama. In the 39th year of the 20th century came the great disillusionment. There was only one problem. 90% of the listeners never heard Orson Welles in his poetic prologue. What were they listening to? To a phenomenon of radio ratings, the Chase and Sanborn Variety Show, starring ventriloquist Edgar Bergen and his sidekick, Charlie McCarthy, the most wooden performer of the era. Aren't you going to do anything for a little itchy, itchy Charlie? <laughs> Halloween. Oh, I may tell you a ghost story. Yeah. <laughs> the Chase and Sanborn show featured Edgar Bergen and Charlie in a comedy sketch for the first 10 minutes or so of the show. Then Nelson Eddy, Hollywood singer, at a low point in his career, came on. We ride men who are happy and free. Birds of a feather who travel together, good soldiers. And a lot of people decided to see if there was something they could listen to on another channel. The War of the Worlds is the first recorded instance of channel surfing or zapping. By this time, the broadcast had donned its Halloween disguise, masquerading as an ordinary evening of radio programming. Dorson was counting on the fact that within radio, a lot of people tune in at all different times. He said, how can I make it as believable as possible? He said, by making it as mundane as possible. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. From the Meridian Room in the Park Plaza Hotel in New York City, we bring you the music of Raymond Raquello and his orchestra. With the touch of the Spanish, Raymond Raquello leads off with La Campesita. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. At 20 minutes before 8 central time, Professor Farrell of the Mount Jennings Observatory, Chicago, Illinois, reports observing several explosions of incandescent gas occurring at regular intervals on the planet Mars. We now return you to the music of Ramon Raquello in downtown New York. The news bulletin came and went with little fanfare. But listeners gathered more closely around their radios when they heard that a world-famous astronomer was getting involved. Ladies and gentlemen, following on the news given in our bulletin a moment ago, we are ready now to take you to the Princeton Observatory at Princeton, where Carl Phillips, our commentator, will interview Professor Richard Pearson, famous astronomer. Professor, would you please tell our radio audience exactly what you see as you observe the planet Mars through your telescope? Nothing unusual at the moment, Mr. Phillips. A uh, red disk swimming in a blue sea. Transverse stripes across the disk. Quite distinct now because Mars happens to be at the point... Many near audience the members didn't realize that astronomer Pearson was only a character, played by Orson Welles himself. Conditions peculiar to the, planet. the news reporter, Carl Phillips, was also portrayed by an actor, Frank Reddick. In your opinion, what do these transverse stripes signify, Professor Pearson? <laughs> Not canals, I can assure you, Mr. Phillips. Hey. Although, that's the popular conjecture of those who imagine Mars to be inhabited. Princeton University added prestige to the newscast. And now that enables the events to, to, to proceed with this prestige and authority behind it. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the latest bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. It is reported that at 8.50 p.m., a huge flaming object believed to be a meteorite, fell on a farm in the neighborhood of Grover's Mill, New Jersey, 22 miles from Trenton. Grover's Mill, New Jersey? It is a real place. Though blink and you'll probably miss it. Grover's Mill's a little town in West Windsor that doesn't have a post office. It's just a mill, that's all, and there's a little community around there. Why did they pick on Grover? That's what they couldn't figure out. <laughs> Why did they pick on us? 
In his mandate to adapt an English science fiction shocker for an American radio audience, scriptwriter Howard Koch needed to find a believable setting where the terror could unfold. And he spread out this New Jersey map, and he took a pencil, and he set it down. And the first place he set it down, he looked and said Grover's Mill. Grover's Mill is 11 miles from Princeton Observatory. But thanks to the magic of radio, newsman Phillips and astronomer Pearson are able to travel there in a matter of seconds. The two men arrive at Grover's Mill just after a fiery metal cylinder has plunged into a farmer's field. What I can see of the object itself doesn't look very much like a meteor. At least not the meteors I've seen. It looks more like a huge cylinder. Has a diameter of, um, um, what would you say, Professor Pearson? What's that? Uh, what would you say, uh, what's the diameter of this? About 30 yards. About 30 yards. The metal on the sheet is? The metal casing is definitely extraterrestrial. Uh, not found on this earth. You can see a cylindrical uh, shape. Minute. Something's happening. Ladies and gentlemen, this is terrific. This end of the thing is beginning to flake off. The top is beginning to rotate like a screw in the... It started to open. I can still hear that sound. They said something was coming out, and of course then we were hooked. We never went back to Edgar Bergen. Millions of listeners never went back to Edgar Bergen. Wells' magic had them hooked but his most amazing illusions were yet to come. As a filmmaker, I've always marveled at director Orson Welles' masterful use of sound and pacing. More than any other medium, convincing radio relies on the power of audio to bring its stories to life. And more than any director before him, Welles understood how to manipulate it. By just 15 minutes into the broadcast, six million Americans were huddled near their radios, transfixed by the sound of a Martian spacecraft beginning to open. Thanks to a carefully placed microphone, the echoes in the men's lavatory, and the sound effects director's trusty pickle jar. It was just a dramatic illusion, but it was beginning to work a little too well. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most terrifying thing I, I've ever witnessed. Someone crawling, someone or something. I can see something wriggling out of the shadow like a gray snake. Oh, yeah, I can see the thing's body. Now it's large, as large as a bear. Eyes are black and they gleam like a serpent. The mouth is that's kind of V-shaped with saliva dripping from its rimless lips. It seems to oh, those quiver and pulsate. And the monster or whatever it is can hardly move. It seems weighed down by uh, possibly gravity or something. The thing's rising up now and the crowd falls back. It seems plenty. That, well, I'll pull this microphone with me as I talk. I'll, I have to stop the description so I can take a new position. Hold on, will you please? I'll be right back in a minute. To radio listeners of the late 30s, Carl Phillips' reaction to the Martians' first appearance should have sounded familiar. Mercury player Frank Reddick modeled his gripping performance of the reporter on a very real radio newsman's run-in with disaster the year before, as witness to the Hindenburg explosion. It's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now. And the famous crashing to the ground. All the humanity and all the best. Compare that to Reddick's character, Carl Phillips. Get the flames springing from the mirror and it leaps right at the advancing men. It strikes them head on. Lords are turning into flames. Now the whole field's caught up by the woods. The bars, the, the gas tanks, tanks for the automobiles are spreading everywhere. It's coming this way now. It's about 20 yards to my right. The dead silence really impressed me. That made it believable. I mean, people knew that unless, if things were going as planned, you had a voice filling in the air. Suddenly when a voice went dead and there was absolute silence, something's wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, due to circumstances beyond our control, we are unable to continue the broadcast from Grover's Mill. I just knew that these people had been wiped out. And uh, 
because there's nothing that could be done. I think I was the first one to stand and start to pace the room. And then finally, the adults were pacing the room too and sort of wringing their hands and talking about what, if anything, they could do. I can make out their cocky uniform. As listeners drew around their radios with growing concern, more bulletins of disaster trickled in. There appears to be some slight smoke. Forty people woods. dead in the field at Grover's Mill, reporter Carl Phillips among them. Well, uh, we ought to the governor smack. placing New Jersey under martial law, then dispatching 7,000 U.S. soldiers to lay waste to the killer creatures, now holed up inside their cylinder. Oh, no, it's nothing but a shadow. Now the troops are on the edge of the Wilmot Farm. 7,000 armed men closing in on an old metal tube. A tub, rather. Well, wait, that wasn't a shadow. It's something moving. Solid metal, kind of a shield-like affair rising up out of the cylinder. It's going higher and higher. What? It's, it's standing on legs, actually rearing up on a sort of metal framework. Now it's reaching above the trees and the searchlights are on it. Hold on. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a grave announcement to make. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. It was that announcement that unleashed the darkest fears in the listening audience. Invasion. Someone comes barging through the door and said, the Martians have landed at Grover's Mill. I felt that maybe there was some association between the Martians and Hitler. That's probably why I felt it was really true. Nowhere was the terror more palpable than at Ground Zero, Grover's Mill. We were just about two and a half miles from Grover's Mill. Boy, my grandfather got all excited. He grabbed the chairs and put them backwards under the door. He said, don't worry about it, kids. We'll be all right. People were going all different directions. I knew people had the general store. I talked to them the next day. They took their money out of their safe, and they were heading for the Poconos. Not everyone in town was headed for the hills. Some grabbed their guns and decided to make a stand. Sean Ellsworth's father and uncle were among them. Somebody shot up with the idea, well, let's you know, form a posse and you know, gather up the Martians. And then the next thing you know, they're shooting into the dead of the night, and the posse would think that it was a Martian hiding behind a tree or behind a bush. There's an old water tower right by the mill. Supposedly, this old fellow thought it was a rocket ship, and he shot his shotgun right at it and put holes in it. <laughs> the monster is now in control of the middle section of New Jersey and has effectively cut the state through its center. Communication lines are down from Pennsylvania to the Atlantic Ocean. Highways to the north, south, and west are clogged with frantic human traffic. And I thought, my mother's home alone. All I thought about was I have to be with my mother. I can't leave her alone. The panic spread well beyond the perimeters of central New Jersey when a Washington official, sounding suspiciously like President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, came forward to address the national emergency. Citizens of the nation, I shall not try to conceal the gravity of the situation that confronts the country, nor the concern of your government in protecting the lives and property of its people. However, it was not Roosevelt, of course, and the broadcast never claimed it was. Private citizens and public officials. But Wells did direct you... actor Kenny Delmar to defy the CBS radio legal department and go ahead with his uncanny Roosevelt imitation. FDR used radio like no other president had. So when they heard, when the people heard Roosevelt's voice coming in telling about a Martian invasion, they believed it. Fortunately, this formidable enemy is still confined to a comparatively small area. And we may place our faith in the military forces to keep them there. 
As more news bulletins poured in, it seemed the Martian forces were rapidly multiplying. The streetlights went out. Not too long after that, my sister came home and she said, Mother, there's a strange smell of gas in the street. And we thought, oi. <laughs> they had wiped out the state police in Trenton. The military had come with the airplanes. They were shooting, but they were shooting them down. Army bombing plane B-843 off Bayonne, New Jersey. Lieutenant Bolt commanding eight bombers. Enemy tripod machines now in sight. Green flash spraying us with flame. No chance to release bombs. Only one thing left, drop on them, plane and all. We're diving on the first one. Now the engine's gone. Eight. I knew it was over. It was the end, as far as I was concerned. Back at CBS Studios in New York City, production personnel still believed it was broadcasting business as usual. Radio pioneer Norman Corwin was working in the building that night, preparing the program which was to follow the War of the Worlds broadcast. I knew zilch about that program when it went on. And I was as close to it as one could be without being in his studio because I was directing a program in a studio just one floor above his. Little did I realize that Orson Welles had emptied the living rooms of America and that I was probably broadcasting to nobody. Every dramatic writer, director, or performer wants to convince you, the audience, to suspend your disbelief, to shut out the real world for a tiny flash of time, during those precious hours, minutes, or seconds that we hold your attention, we strive to make our illusions feel absolutely real to you. In The War of the Worlds, Orson Welles set out to tell the ultimate ghost story, to fascinate, to mesmerize, to trigger hearts to race with fear. He never expected that a million listeners would experience all those emotions and never catch on that it was just entertainment. People saw diametrically different events, but interpreted them in the same way. Some people looked out the window and they saw that there was no traffic, and they interpreted that to mean that the Martians had landed and people were fleeing the city. Other people saw plenty of traffic on their streets, and they interpreted that to mean that the Martians had landed and people were fleeing the city. By this time, the end of the world had moved into the streets. Cars careened wildly down highways. Frantic family members from coast to coast jammed America's phone lines, trying to learn whether distant loved ones had survived the Martian attack. The New York Telephone Company had just began telling their operators to be more courteous. And a supervisor was walking down the hall and someone was saying, I'm, I'm sorry, but we don't have that information. And the supervisor said, that was very good. You know, what information did they want? They wanted to know if the world was coming to an end. I walked around the block and I noticed that the police had all gone. I said, where's all the cops gone? And they said they went home to protect their families. Phones were also ringing off the hook in the place where the invasion had really begun. Studio One at the Columbia Broadcasting System. On hearing rumors of the panic, station executives realized the broadcast had been running for nearly 30 minutes without a break and signaled to Wells to pause for station identification. Never one to sacrifice good drama to red tape, Wells continued on for another five minutes until his Martians had completely annihilated the city of New York and the CBS building. I'm speaking from the roof of broadcasting building, New York City. The bells you hear are ringing to warn the people to evacuate the city as Martians approach. People are holding service here below us in the cathedral. The enemy is now in sight above the Palisades. I can see it from here, waiting, waiting the Hudson like a man waiting through a brook. This is the end now. Smoke 
comes out. Black smoke drifting over the city. People in the streets see it now. They're running toward the East River, thousands of them, dropping in like rats. Now the smoke's crossing 6th Avenue. 5th Avenue. <laughs> uh, a hundred yards away. It's... It's... It's a feet. suggest that Orson did not know that that long mid-break in the show would intensify the drama, would create more panic, would create more heightened reality, is to not know anything about Orson's way of working. Everything, including silence, was a weapon creatively. Everything was an effect. And silence, mid-break, mid everything was very, very deliberately worked out. with New York in ruins and the Martian death machines merrily demolishing the rest of the country, an announcer broke in with this message. You are listening to a CBS presentation of Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in an original dramatization of The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. It was too little, too late. Hundreds of thousands of listeners had long since left their radios and were fleeing in their cars, praying in silence with loved ones, or were crowding the streets, their faces covered by wet cloths for protection against Martian gas, scanning the skies for signs of mankind's last battle. Ever so slowly, they came to their own realizations. And I think my mother thought something had happened to my mind. She did not know why I was so upset. She turned on the radio. So then she realized and patted me and hugged me, and she said, that's all right, dear. Let us pray that we're not having a war. Back at CBS Studios, the drama for Wells and his Mercury players was only beginning. As their performance wound to a close, actors began to notice strange and frenzied activity taking place all around them. Uniformed police officers started entering, you know, being on the other side of the glass. Yeah, they, Wells knew something was up. Bill Hers, who was then a 22-year-old actor in the company, also noticed the commotion. Somebody thought they were there to arrest us. It turns out they weren't there, they were there to protect us. Unbeknownst to the actors, the studio was under siege from furious phone calls and threats as those still paralyzed by fear finally realized the truth. This is Orson Welles, ladies and gentlemen. Out of character, to assure you that the War of the Worlds has no further significance than as the holiday offering it was intended to be. The Mercury Theater's own radio version of dressing up in a sheet and jumping out of a bush and saying boo. It was clear, but extremely cavalier. People really were too uh, frightened to be angry for a while, and then they became very angry. Leaving the CBS studios through the back door, Wells and company rushed across town to begin rehearsals for their Broadway play. It wasn't until they passed the electronic billboard in Times Square that they realized the full impact of their broadcast. It's where all the latest news is flashed. It had the Orson Welles invasion program scares the nation. So, I mean, it, was, it wasn't local. It was nationwide. Everybody was quite disturbed. We got to the theater, and there was a mob of reporters. 
And it's really the only time in my life that I ever saw Orson taken aback by something like this. He was shocked when he started hearing stories that implied that there might be some dangers. It never occurred to him that people could actually get hurt. And that really profoundly affected him. He started thinking about the moral responsibilities of storytelling on such a powerful medium. Wells and the cast were interviewed by the police, by the network executives. And for a while that night, I mean, it appeared that their careers might be over. When we return, the master manipulator faces the music, and a panicked nation tries to make sense of it all. Halloween morning, 1938. Monday's headlines confirm the inexplicable news. Amidst exaggerated reports of heart attacks, accidents, and even suicides, Orson Welles and CBS had a lot of explaining to do. There were no suicides, you know, there were no people trampled to death. I mean, it, it a lot of things were rumored. Learning about the and some of it was just digging by reporters. Do you think that this will cause uh, the curbing of uh, radio bulletins on the air today? Have you altered your plans for future problems in any way as a result of this incident? Don't you think that somebody here would have been able to gauge the reaction which in fact has occurred throughout the United States? Well, CBS was embarrassed. They were a little frightened. None of them expected that reaction. With me or they uh, hemmed and hawed and uh, they had a press conference. Do you think there ought to be a law uh, against such uh, enactments as we had last night or as a result of that? I don't know what the legislation would be. We simply, radio is new and we are learning about the effect it has on people. We learned a terrible lesson. I think it is the first time that, that the real understanding of the power of mass media in, uh, in a, in a non-political way. I mean, we'd already learned the power for good that radio could have as a unifying experience. But I don't think anybody realized the potential for danger involved in radio till Orson did that. Were you aware of terror at the time you were giving this role? Were you aware that terror was going on throughout oh, no. the nation? Oh, no, of course not. No. We did drag Wills gave the greatest performance of his career at that press People conference. Would, uh, react as they do in a movie. So pious, so shaken, so guilty. Quiet. Do you want me to speak now? I'm sorry. Yeah. Of course, we are deeply shocked and deeply regretful about the results of uh, last night's broadcast. And through it all, he knew he was on every front page in the country. This was publicity that money couldn't buy. His future was assured. Once the Martian dust had settled, the War of the Worlds proved to be a bonanza to Orson Welles' career. Within a few days, the Mercury Theater on the air would have its first sponsor, Campbell's Soup. Within a year, Welles would be on his way to Hollywood to mastermind some of history's most unforgettable films, including Citizen Kane, voted by the American Film Institute as the greatest movie of all time. If you see Othello, if you see Macbeth, if you see Touch of Evil, there was no precedent for what he did in any field. Other members of the Mercury Theater would also go on to glowing careers. Writer Howard Koch would co-write the Academy Award-winning classic, Casablanca. While musical director Bernard Herrmann would become one of Hollywood's most successful composers providing the haunting scores for films like Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho and Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver. Meanwhile, radio broadcasters and government officials had to come to grips with the power of radio over American hearts and minds. The first reaction was knee-jerk, a call by the FCC for all broadcasts to have prior government approval. The solution was more in keeping with the spirit of free speech. Broadcasters agreed to censor themselves and to use disclaimers in any program where the lines between truth and fiction could be blurred. But this couldn't prevent other nations from falling victim to Martian mania. In 1949, the Hotch War of the World script was redone in Ecuador. And the people panicked, a much bigger panic than we had in this country. And when the people learned they'd been deceived, they stormed the building that the radio station was in. 
the Ecuadorian station burned to the ground, leaving six people dead. A sober reminder of media's overpowering influence. It has been 60 years since that Halloween Eve, sufficient time for journalists, politicians, psychologists, and poets to have pondered the legacy of the panic broadcast. Was it truly a case of media out of control or simply mass hysteria? Was it a fluke, an aberration, or something that might easily happen again? Television and media is so much more powerful now, and it has so much more of an entree into our lives. An artist of Orson's dimension playing with that could, could wreak havoc in the world. Give him 10 minutes on CNN, and I can imagine what he could do by an illusory news program about an atomic attack or something. I mean, he could do anything. Do you believe it could happen again? Whether or not you do believe that it did happen once, in a nation struggling to escape its past yet fearful of its future, America, 60 years ago on Halloween Eve, when a handful of actors in a studio with a clever script and a brilliant director convinced a million radio listeners that the end of the world was at hand, something they seemed frighteningly ready to believe. It was horrible. It was one of the most traumatic experiences in my childhood. It was a terrific show, and it, it did what it... It's just, if you turned in late, you were in trouble. Like any great trauma in our own personal experience, it does not fade from memory. War of the Worlds is an immortal event. And on the 75th anniversary and the 100th anniversary, people will be listening to it again, and it'll be on people's minds. So goodbye, everybody, and remember, please, for the next day or so, the terrible lesson you learned tonight. That grinning, glowing globular invader of your living room is an inhabitant of the pumpkin patch, and if your doorbell rings and nobody's there, that was no Martian, it's Halloween. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man. It is reported that at 8.50 p.m., a huge flaming object, believed to be a meteorite, fell on a farm in the neighborhood of Grover's Mill, New Jersey, 22 miles from Trenton. Oh, yeah, I can see the thing's body now. It's large. It's large as a bear. It just looks like wet leather, but that face, it, it, ladies and gentlemen, it's indescribable. I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. It strikes him head on. Lord, they're turning into flames. Ah! Oh, he is caught up by the woods. The fire is coming this way now. About 20 yards to my right. The city of New York lay in ruins. The state of New Jersey had been declared a disaster area. And the entire U.S. Air Force had been downed by a seemingly unbeatable enemy invader. Ladies and gentlemen, incredible as it may seem, those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. At least, if you believed what you heard on the radio. I'm Jim Cameron. On Halloween Eve 1938, an estimated one million listeners actually thought America was under attack from Martian invaders. People panicked. They ran into the streets. They packed up their families and headed for the hills, all because of a radio play. Your home and workplace, and made you a part of it. Suddenly, a third of the population was listening to one show every night. This took a nation of immigrants and made us a people made us Americans. Bring up the boys, man. Tell them to meet me at Pine Creek Forks. The Flying B payroll's been robbed. Tell the boys to ride. The radio was on 24 hours a day. It was a silver tone. It was the name of the radio, and it had an eye. And you knew you were tuned in when the eye resembled most a human eye. It doesn't make any sense, but the eye seemed to be part of the family. Americans passionately loved and trusted their radios. They turned to them for comfort during the Great Economic Depression. 
and relied on them for up-to-the-minute news as Adolf Hitler's military aggressions in Europe grew more threatening by the day. Listeners also depended upon their magical talking boxes for entertainment, for a few precious moments of fantasy and escape from their daily lives. Radio is the theater of the imagination. Radio is the theater of the mind. Hold up here. We set fire to the gap and stop. Whoa. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, swim. The listener at home created the images. They created what the characters looked like. Where's your port? Wells also believed that combining science fiction with radio might help solve his most pressing problem, ratings. His own radio show, The Mercury Theater on the Air, was winning rave reviews, but nobody seemed to be listening. The show couldn't even attract a sponsor. With Halloween just around the corner, Wells and his partner, producer John Houseman, were looking for a way to spark their ratings by giving the audience a good scare. They set their sights on War of the Worlds, a novella by the father of sci-fi, H.G. Wells. Just six days before Halloween Eve, Wells ordered staff writer Howard Koch to update this 1898 tale set in Victorian England into an edgy, modern American thriller. It basically becomes almost a whole new story. I mean, they've got the title, but they can't do it in the modern day without making a lot of changes. And Koch kept trying to beg out of it and saying, I can't do it. And they kept saying, you have to. Black, New York, the Queen Mary. Koch and Wells agreed on the technique of breaking news updates to give the production an immediate and contemporary feel. They couldn't have imagined then how fateful a decision using that technique would be. In an adaptation of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, a broadcast so explosive, it changed media forever. panic broadcast happened 60 years ago but we continue to wonder today how could people have believed something so outrageous was it intended as a mean-spirited hoax or simply a chillingly good ghost story for a Halloween Eve in order to find the answers we need to travel back in time to the fall of 1938 to an era when a magical gadget filled with glowing tubes and a vibrating speaker was fast becoming the focal point of America's households. Back in the 30s, long before television and with talking pictures still in their infancy, radio was mass media, the only game in town. From breaking news to soap operas, dramas and comedies. There is a doctor in the house. A physician who, without anesthetic, sets your body bone, tickles your ribs, and splits your side. It brought the world into your... He's back on the far section with the reaper. There's another form of popular entertainment that also draws on the power of the imagination to work its sorcery. Science fiction. In the 1930s, most sci-fi came in the form of four-color comic strips and lurid pulp magazines. Or B-movies about planet-hopping cowboys with names like Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon. Their idea of special effects was primitive, to say the least. We must destroy that ship. I'll drop down on it. Knock off. Radio of the Earth. There was one man working on the cutting edge of radio who saw past that hokiness and envisioned science fiction's dramatic potential. His name was Orson Welles, 
the 23-year-old boy genius of the New York stage, and a popular voice-for-hire actor on the airwaves. Wells instinctively understood that the persuasive power of radio, plus the outlandishness of science fiction, could yield explosive results. Orson loved science fiction. The thing he always said about science fiction was that it was magic, because you were inventing universes that didn't exist. He knew that everybody had their own demons, so if he just gave you the right background music for the demon, you would create the demon for him.